Good day, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining. This is Jason with Top Shelf Traders. It's great to have everyone here with us. As the room fills up, let's just do a quick yes and yes. Let me know that you can hear me okay and that you can see Dan's screen okay, the stress-free way to trade. Just a quick yes and yes in the questions box will do the trick. All right. Perfect. Perfect. Well, we're thrilled to have Dan Cook with us here. He's with Nadex. He's in charge of business development. And he's going to talk about a topic that we cover in one way or another every day. Uh, but it's often overlooked. And for many traders, it's something that they hate to bring up. It involves losses. Now, everyone knows that losses are a part of trading, but no one ever likes to plan for them and let alone factor them in to how they trade. Everyone's focused on profits. And for many folks, that is really something that is the beginning of the end for their trading. They don't have a system as to how to work with or deal with losses. So working with the famous quote from Amos Hostetter, take care of your losses and the profits will take care of themselves. Dan is going to be taking us through a handful of things. The single ingredient that all traders have, how to embrace losses as part of successful trading. Key principles you can follow, so a system, and how to change the way you look at losses. And if you've heard of Dan before, well, that's not by accident. He's been around for over at least 20 years, uh, either as a trader, a coach, even running a brokerage firm, and now he's at Nadex. So uh, for those of you that are with us and, and joining just now, uh, as always, this session is going to be recorded and we'll make sure that that's available for you. And then also I'll apologize for the background noise. I'm going to go on mute. I'm actually traveling today, so I don't want that to be a distraction. But Dan, it's great to have you. We're thrilled that you're here and uh, I'll turn it over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, it's great to be here. Thank you uh, for having me on. You know, as as you mentioned, I've I've been around a while. I started trading in '97. Um, uh, uh, still trade, um, love it. I had a chance to work as a trading coach. And what we're going to be talking about today, um, something very near and dear to my heart, which is really like risk management and embracing losses because they do happen. Um, what we're really uh, going to going to focus on today, and and hopefully there'll be some. Um, uh, like all industries, there's some great stories that come out over the years. So hopefully you'll find some of those uh, entertaining. But this is the stress-free way to trade, or actually what I like to call the stress-free way to lose money trading. Um, this is based on things that I've seen, that I've done myself. Um, I feel very fortunate having worked for brokerage firms, having been a trading coach where I could actually see thousands of people trading. And I've seen, um, I mean, the, the statistics are just grim as far as individuals uh, uh, and, and the outcome, the expected outcome of how long they'll last in the market. And a lot of it all has to do with losses, right? We get in, and I remember when I started, I thought, man, if I just knew what strategy the pros were using, what time frame they're looking at, what indicators, I could be a great trader. And uh, what I learned is you can have the best strategy in the world, and it's it's almost never the strategy that fails unless it's just really horrific. Um, but you should find out pretty quick it's, if it's horrific or not. It's all about risk management and those things. So one of the big things is also how stress impacts trading. So we're going to talk about that. And uh, real quick, uh, Jason, I uh, just want to make sure that uh, you could see my screen change. Should be seeing the agenda. I uh, would we'll just give it uh, maybe one more try. I'm watching it right now. Yeah, let's see. Oh, you know what? There it is. There it is. Okay. I'm just going to flip it back real quick and uh, hold on one second. And apologies, we just switched offices. So um, some of the technology I'm still getting used to. Okay. So we should be on the agenda screen. So we're going to talk about some of these risk management essentials and really how to lose money. Now, that's um, not a topic a lot of people want to embrace, right? We all got into trading to make money. but that's only half the picture, right? And if we take care of those losses, um, we can really work on, on, on the profits. But it's all about, you know, doing the right way to lose money, not freaking out about it. It's a natural part. We're also going to take a look at a directional trade, um, Nadex uh, contract called a spread overview. And for those of you that don't know, real quick, Nadex is an exchange, CFTC regulated, based in Chicago, 
where we're unique is that we're actually designed for the individual trader. Um, I've traded CME products a lot. I also understand that CME products can be pretty tough um, unless you have a pretty large account. So what we wanted to create at Nadex was a way where individuals could come directly to the exchange, not have to go through a broker, trade the most popular markets, things like stock index futures, commodities, currencies, um, but do it in a sensible way at a risk level that was that was good for them or comfortable for them. And I'm going to show you a few, few resources as well. Um, and I'll talk more about those when we when we get farther along. So as a quick risk disclosure before we get started, hopefully everybody knows you put money into a market, you place a trade, it involves risk, right? You need to take responsibility for that risk. You need to manage that risk, which we'll talk a lot about. Um, the one thing you won't see on the Nadex risk disclaimer um, that you'll see in every other leveraged market, anybody out there trading Forex, uh, they've seen these a ton, anybody trading futures or any other leveraged product, you'll see a disclosure that says you can lose more money than you have in your account. Trust me, I've seen that happen more than 20,000 times. Oftentimes it happened in one day. Um, that you'll never see on a Nadex risk disclosure. Um, and that's because all of the products, and we'll take a look at them, are defined risk by their very nature. So your risk is what you put up for the trade. That's the most you can ever lose. So with that, let's get into this. And um, there's just a couple of quotes I like. And, and Jason already said the one that I always uh, like to start out with is Amos Haas said, or take care of your losses and the profits take care of themselves. Um, that, that is so true. Um, these are a couple others that I've run across over the years. Um, ben Stein, nobody is too stupid to make money in the markets, but there are many who are too smart. Um, I don't know if anybody else has ever tried to outsmart themselves um, when it comes to trading. I remember just uh, indicators all over my screen. Oh, this is going to be great. And then I just got paralyzed. A lot of bad things happen when we think we're too smart. Uh, we should try to work with the markets, not against it. I really don't like the term beat the market. Um, I understand what it means, but uh, if we're trying to beat it, wouldn't we rather work with it? Um, and that's what we're going to talk about as well, because if the market goes against us, which happens, how do we how do we manage that? And then prediction is very difficult, particularly if it's about the future. And this uh, Niels Bohr obviously was a physicist, um, but it applies to trading in that it is very difficult, even with the best strategy or system, to know the future. And the market, once we think we know the future, we see the perfect trade setup, uh, will prove us wrong time and again. So with that, and I'm going to take this is uh, as I mentioned, this is coming from my own experience as well as a lot of people that I've worked with. Um, hundreds as a coach, and I've, I've worked with just thousands as a broker and um, seen patterns develop um, that really have led to the downfall, and in my opinion, are the most common things that lead to the downfall. You've probably heard all of these before. Um, hopefully, uh, there'll be some decent stories that shed a little bit more light on that and, uh, and bring them to life a bit. So how I see people lose money. So this slide is what they do or don't do and how they lose money and how we want to correct those things. So the first thing I see is they don't have a trading plan and they don't plan for every trade. Um, you've probably heard that um, there's a ton of trading plans out there. Um, you can find a template all over. Um, I want to define really what I mean by a trading plan though. And I'll give an example. I, uh, I used to run, it was, um, it was like a 30 day to 60 day, depending on the pace of the person, coaching program. And the first thing started out was the trading plan and it was a three page template. Now, as a trading plan, right, I want to know why, from myself, why am I trading? And the first answer I always get is, well, to make money. But what do you want to do with that money, right? What, what is it that you want to do with it? It's got to be tangible. It's got to be real. In that plan, and we'll talk about when you take the money, right? If you have a $10,000 account and it goes to 15000 what do you do? Do you try to double it up? Well, that's how people get into trouble. You should have a plan that says, okay, if I go to 10 to 15, I'm going to pull 2,500 out. If I start at five and I go to seven, maybe I take $1,000 out. I was talking to a trading group um, yesterday or some uh, guys from my industry, and uh, it was the first time I'd heard it. One of their traders that they knew very well, who was a really great longtime trader, actually kept money in a safe in his, in his vault. And before he started trading, he would pull money out and whatever he lost on a trade, he would set to one side and he held the money because then it was tangible. Um, now, I don't think probably, well, maybe we all have stacks of money sitting in a vault, um, but I just thought that was a good thing. Here's the thing. It doesn't take stacks of money. If it's 20 bucks, if it's 50 bucks, make it real, make it tangible, but have that plan. And that's not just for the overall, right? You should have that plan for the overall scope. 
One other thing about the trading plan, I once had a guy send me a 118 tr page trading plan. Uh, it was ridiculous. It had caveats in there for every possible situation the market could make. I mean, I swear, literally, it was like, if the cat walks across my keyboard while I'm making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and I'm in this trade, it might be a little facetious there, but it was almost that in depth. Um, to me, a trading plan is just the basic structure for how we go about our day-to-day -day lives and, and how we trade and, and what rules we have in place. It's not every contingency the market makes. The downfall to that, and I've even seen less complex ones, but they have all these rules um, on the strategies. And if the market does this, you get paralyzed. Always trade what's in front of you, right? Think of a trading plan, at least in my mind, as kind of like a life plan, right? It's not all the specifics of how you execute and what you do. It can include some of that. Um, but it should have things like position sizing versus funding, and those are things we'll talk about in a minute. And another one, you have to plan every trade. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever seen the movie uh, Ronin with Robert De Niro. Um, great movie, but I'll just I'll just set up the opening scene. There's there's this meet. Um, somebody that nobody knows has arranged this meeting with a bunch of people who have never met each other before. And there's a few people in this restaurant, and Robert De Niro walks in, and, and they meet. And somebody comes in the back door, and they go, "Okay, the van's here. Let's go." As they're walking out the back door, um, Robert De Niro reaches behind a, a set of boxes that are by this van and he pulls out a handgun, puts it away, and the guy looks at him like, where'd that come from? And De Niro's line, which applies to trading, is I never walk into a room I don't know how to walk out of. You should know, particularly if you're trading leverage, how do you walk out of that trade, right? You don't wanna limp out with a huge loss. You definitely don't wanna go out with a broken leg. What you want to do is you want to manage that risk. You want to know if the market goes to this and I'm in profit, what do I do at that point? Do I take some, do I take part of my position off? Do I trail my stop? Have that plan before you get in. The next one is position sizing and funding or what I call trade stupid. This is what I've seen way too often, particularly when people start taking losses, um, which is the last time they should be increasing their position size. Uh, I know I've tried to double up, right? Because it's, uh, hey, I, I'm trading three contracts, but I just took a couple of losses. I'm going to trade six because it's going to work this time. That's just the road to destruction for your trading account, right? Position sizing. Understand what it is you're trading. If you've got a $10,000 account, and I've seen this, even if your broker gives you intraday margin, that doesn't mean you should trade uh, an oil contract. Even if you have the capital in there to support the margin at $1,000 per point, that's 10% of your account per point risk. Not right, right? Understand the funding to the position sizing, the per point move of the markets. Um, one other thing on position sizing. Um, I don't ever believe in doubling position sizing. I've seen it happen way too many times where people are doing well. So they're like, oh, I'm just going to go from trading one contract to two, and then they go from two to four, and then they go four to eight. Another way, always just go up in increments of one. Um, and now, one thing I'll say, and at least in my experience, it's very difficult to make money trading one contract. Um, if you need to go to a smaller contract, there are contracts of all different sizes, should be able to at least trade two. And the reason I say this is a lot of times you're grinding it out, right? You're taking small losses, but occasionally there'll be a runner. If you're only trading one contract, right? You have to take the limit order, right? Take it on one contract and then you can let the other one run, however far that might be, then trail a stop. Um, from position sizing, that's that's my best advice. Don't just double up, particularly when you're taking losses, but even when, when you're having a good run, don't just double up, go up in increments of one. That should also go along with when you're taking money out of the market. The next one that just happens all too much, over trading, right? We get into trading because we wanna make money. We're traders, we need to trade. We're in front of our screen, where's the opportunity? What am I looking at? Let's go, let's go, let's go. We're hearing these bells and whistles. And cash is a position, is what I'll say about that. The best traders are patient traders. They understand that. I had a mentor of mine once uh, once tell a group of us, uh, this was back in my early days, this was early, early 2000s. Uh, and he basically said, somebody asked him, and there was actually made the comment, you must have the most exciting job in the world. And he looked at him and goes, no, you know what? Trading shouldn't be exciting. If your heart's racing and your palms are sweating, you're doing it wrong. You're taking on too much risk, i.e. position sizing. You're over trading. It shouldn't be a roller coaster ride. It can be fun, but there should be a method to it and one that you can quantify. And so cash is a position. If you remember one thing today, keep that in mind because that's number one downfalls that I see of a lot of traders is that they come in and they just start trading, 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 trading without having a solid, um, solid plan 
for each trade um, or the patience to execute it. And if you're just trading a bunch, um, we'll get into tracking trades in a bit, it's impossible to really tell where you're at. The best traders I've ever seen aren't the most sophisticated. Um, they have very simple strategies and they understand their risk and it's something they can repeat over and over and over and over again. Similar to, I don't know if anybody watches golf, but if you watch um, you know, a professional golfer um, or even baseball, um, when they come to the plate, they typically have the same routine, right? They do the same things. There should be a system that you can replicate over and over and over again. We also have to understand correlation of markets, right? Um, whether it be a direct correlation, meaning if one market is moving up, the other market's moving up, or if one market's moving up, the other market is moving down. If you're trading high correl highly correlated markets, not a terrible thing, but you need to understand that, right? Because if you go long on two markets that effectively move in exactly the same direction in lockstep 99% of the time, all you're doing is doubling your risk. Yes, doubling your potential reward, but that gets you out of your risk tolerance. So understand market correlation. Uh, one of the reasons why I only trade five or six different instruments at any given time is because I can really understand those instruments. I can understand how they move with each other. If I was trying to trade 30 different instruments, it'd be pretty tough. Another one, wanting to be right and hanging on to losers. And there's actually uh, two parts to this. So, right, um, risk should really be assumed at the outset of the trade, right? Um, I've seen some great swing traders, um, but they never can tell me if they're getting into a trade, if it's going to be a swing trade. The market has to determine that. They're great swing traders because they expect the market to do something within, say, an hour, maybe two or three hours. And if it doesn't, they get out. They cut their losses, right? It's not about being right. It's being profitable. I've had at least probably four or 500 conversations over the years with somebody. I'll give an example. I'll call up Joe and Joe um, is, uh, and apologies if anybody on here is named Joe, this is not directed at you. Um, this is just in general. Call them up. They had $10,000 in their account and I look at their account and they're down to 6,500. And you'd expect them to be pretty upset. But invariably, invariably, um, I will call them up. And if they've been hitting quite a few trades, I will call them up and the conversation will go something like this. I'll be like, hey, Joe, this is Dan. How's everything going? Joe will be like, oh, it's amazing. This is awesome, man. I'm doing great. And I'm like, really? And they're like, yeah, I'm, I'm right on 70% of my trades. I just have to make a couple small adjustments and I'll be right there. And no, Joe, you're bleeding cash. Another thing I'll say is if, if you're taking losses, step away. There's nothing wrong with stepping away. Reassess. If nothing else, just get your mind right. Um, that's so important, the psychology of this. I'll give another example of, uh, this was a guy that was actually in my industry. Um, I'd worked with for years. Um, I used to sit in my office and I would call out my trades. I was pretty much trading all day, every day. I was market analyst as well, but I was trading every day. And I, this was a currency pair. And so I looked at a decent setup. This was on the Euro USD. Uh, so I yelled out of my office. I was like, short Euro USD three lots, stop at 25 pips, right? Trade sets up and as often happens when I place a trade and right then uh, uh, my coworker yells back at me, he's like, I'm in. And uh, as typically happens when I trade, it was about two and a half minutes later, I got stopped out, right? You get into a position, all of a sudden, boom, the market goes against you. I walked out of my office, kind of shaking my head and I go, oh, uh, we'll get him next time, no big deal. And uh, he said to me, he's like, I I'm still in the trade. And I was like, Really? I was like, where's your stop? And he said, oh, I have a mental stop. And I was like, okay, where's your mental stop? And he's like, oh, I, I don't know yet. I'm going to wait to see what the market does. Well, so it's a few days later. I walk in. He's still in the trade. And his comment was, well, it, it's a swing trade. It's a swing trade. No, he just couldn't admit that he was wrong. So this goes on. Um, he was in the trade for about six weeks. For four weeks, he's losing, losing, losing. He is down about 18 grand. And he's about 20 pips from getting margined out of the position, meaning he's just, they're just going to force close because he's not going to have enough money left in the account um, after you take away his losses to sustain the position from a margin perspective. 20 pips. Well, he gets lucky. The market starts dropping and it's dropping. And it's like a week and a half, two weeks later, market drops. We got in at 127.60. 
the market gets to 127.50 and he closes the trade. Oh, by the way, it went from a short-term trade to a swing trade to a couple weeks in. He's like, oh, that was just a punt anyway. I don't care about it, right? Couldn't He didn't want to say he was wrong. He could have said he was wrong three and a half minutes into the trade, which he should have, because in the six weeks that he held this, um, I don't know how many other trades I placed and he didn't have the collateral to do that. Right. So it goes 10 pips in his favor and he closes it out for profit. And he couldn't wait to tell me and put it in my face that that trade worked out. Hopefully nobody does that. Um, that may be kind of an extreme example. I've seen several things in the market similar to that. Right. Just admit it. Be wrong. There's nothing. I, I've seen people that are wrong 90% of the time that still make money trading. They're some of the best traders I know. It's not about being right or wrong. It's about being profitable. And this kind of goes back to the, you know, not assuming the risk at the outset of the trade, right? When you get into a trade, you're getting in for a reason, right? You should understand if it's indicators, if it's patterns, fundamentals, technicals, I don't care what it is, but the market should do what you expect it to do in the time frame that you expect it to do. And if you're a day trader, be a day trader. Um, day traders are swing traders and swing traders are day traders. I, th I even think it's tough to be a good investor without understanding the basic concepts of trading, right? Because if even if you're looking at a longer per term position, maybe an option or like a stock, you should still have, and maybe it's not going to move to those targets in the day, you should still have a reasonable level where if it goes against you, you take it off, reassess. Nothing wrong with taking some losses. Take small losses, not big ones. Um, I, I've just seen way too many times um, where all of a sudden it's the big loss. And there's there's a theory in the market. Um, I from my experience, I, I, it seems to be right. And this came from a friend of mine who ran one of the most successful brokerage firms I've, um, that, that I've seen. Um, he said, no matter how long it takes somebody to lose 50% of their money, once they lose 50%, if they don't step away, they'll be gone in two days. It's just, uh, they start chasing. And I, I went back and started looking at that and it absolutely is true. So if you are taking losses, that's another thing step away. Nothing wrong with being out of the market. Put it into cash for a little bit. Reassess. Risk and reward, and we all talk about risk and reward and trading psychology, and really trading psychology comes down to human psychology, right? Um, we talk about risk and reward, and while we're focusing on risk here, there's also that other side of reward. So I'm going to take a, a flip side because this is another one that I've seen. When people we talked about hanging on to losers. Sometimes people hang on to winners too long. They don't have their plan to get out. I'll rem I remember one, I used to uh, run a nightly session where we do market analysis and people would follow along with me as I was trading live and they'd execute trades as well. They, um, there was one night in this trade, worked out, it was good. We basically put on our, we had our plan, put on the, got the order in, put on our stop, had a first profit target and then a second profit with a, a trailing stop. That's how the second one was going to come off is through a trailing stop. And it worked out great. I got a call the next day I'm in my office and the guy that was on the call was like, hey, Dan, I got into that trade last night. I was like, oh, great. Um, you know, it worked out. He's like, well, what do I do now? I was like, what do you mean? He said, well, I'm still in the trade. Right? You need to have that plan. And this this happens quite often, giving money back to the market after it's yours understand that plan because sometimes people are like very, um, sometimes reward um, can be almost as bad as um, um, the, the risk because they, they, they're scared to take profits. They want more, they get greedy. Um, um, so always understand the plan on both sides, risk and reward. Other people don't track their trades, right? They get in, they start trading, um, and they they don't really know. Losses are great. Losses are awesome because you can learn from them. If you're not learning from them, then they're just losses. Um, I'll go back to, uh, real quick, I'm gonna step back to, to trading stupid um, because just wanna share um, one thing with you on that one. Um, and this kind of goes right back to this point on, on tracking trades um, because you don't necessarily understand when you're trading stupid, you're not learning from them. The worst thing I've ever seen um, when somebody places a stupid trade is, is not that they lose all their money. It's that they make money trading stupid because they get rewarded for it. And 
this is on the reward side, right? Understand if you're trading stupid and you get rewarded for it, hey, you got lucky. Don't make it a habit. I actually had a friend one time. Uh, we might not have enough time for the whole story. Um, I just talked to him last night, actually. Uh, great floor trader, um, but was placing stupid trades, wasn't actually tracking them. Um, but he was just, and he continued to do that. Um, what he did was he went out and bought a dog shock collar, strapped it to his leg, and literally sat in the office one day and hit the button every time he placed a stupid trade. And a stupid trade is not just a trade that loses money. Stupid trade can be ones that make money. If you track your trades though, oh, by the way, he said that did absolutely break him of his habit. Um, and, and still to this day, and that was three years ago, I was in his office a couple months ago and the dog shot collar is still sitting there on his desk. Um, when you track your trades, I'm not a big Excel fan. Uh, when I work for this exchange, I spend a lot of time in reporting in Excel. Not what I dreamt of you know, uh, growing up that I'd be an Excel master. What I like to do is when you place a trade, first thing you do, um, well, first thing you do is you have your trading plan, right? Go and get your trading plan. In your trading plan, two elements you need, um, actually probably three. Go out, get a ream of paper, get a three hole punch and a three ring binder, right? When you place a trade, right? Take a screenshot of it on, it, it's so easy, right? Particularly if you're using technicals, um, I believe you just hit control print screen on a PC. I'm not sure what it is on the Mac. I think it's like the Apple sign print screen. You can Google it, figure it out. Um, take a screenshot, drop it into, I like PowerPoint rather than Word just because it lines up better. Drop it into a PowerPoint document. When the trade completes, good, bad, or otherwise, take another screenshot. You know, maybe you're taking a couple as the trade progresses. Keep those, keep a log of them. I always, uh, if I have like two or three pages, maybe four for each trade, I staple them together just so they stay together. But when you have that, it's so valuable because you can go back and take your take a look at your losses. You'll probably discover something about those trades. I was at a conference in Fort Worth um, uh, about a month and a half ago, and I was talking to this guy that two years ago, he got injured at work. His wife took $10,000 out, out of her 401k to fund his trading account. Funds his trading account, starts trading, and he's doing really well at first. Now, first six, seven months, he's doing pretty well. Things are great. He's got this down. Well, market starts to change a little bit. That happens. He starts taking losses. All of a sudden, he's down below where he you know, started getting in. Instead of doubling up, what he did was he had been tracking all of his trades, and he did very similar to what I did back in 2004, was he set them all out on a table. And he took all of his losers and he just set them out on a table and he stopped trading and he just started studying those. And if you don't have them printed out, that's why I don't believe in just keeping them electronically. You have to be able to print them out. You won't be able to tell the patterns of yourself if you're just looking at thing, something on the screen while you're scrolling. Be able to print them out, put them out on a table. I don't care if you're the most successful trader in the world, you can always learn. This is one of the most important things. Track all of your trades, take your losses, and look at them. And if you start setting them side by side and moving them around, a pattern will develop. And I know for me personally, when I did that um, a, a long time ago, and I do it occasionally still, you find those patterns. And I was able to look at, um, I was using fibs and some pattern recognition at the time, along with a couple of other, um, I've never been a huge indicator fan necessarily. I use a couple, um, but um, I like price action is my favorite indicator. But I was able to find on these trades that I got stopped out a very common element on over 30% of them. And that helped me moving forward. So losses aren't bad. Losses are how we learn, but we have to be able to learn from them. The last one I see people do is they don't take the money. Um, this is a big one. And I don't just mean on the trade, on an individual trade. I mean in their account. I talked about a little bit at the beginning on having a trading plan. And that's you've got to have a plan for when you take money out of your account. Um, if it's again, 10,000 and you get to 15,000 and you say, I'm going to take 2,500. Great. Take 2,500. Maybe then if you get to 20,000, maybe then you take 4,000 out, whatever those numbers are, have a plan. Right. And also in that plan to take the money, when you get to a certain level, decide when you're going to add one more contract to your positions, what risk you can take on those positions. Another, um, quick story and hopefully these stories aren't, aren't too boring um, they're just based on uh, you know things I've seen and, and hopefully it brings it to life a little bit about you this is probably one of the worst cases I've seen 
Oh, by the way, if you don't take the money, it never becomes tangible and it's only a matter of time before the market takes it back. You have to take it out of your account at some time. Um, if you're profitable, you have to have a plan to do that. There was a guy, uh, this was uh, in 2008, opened an account with me. Um, markets were pretty volatile. Um, it was still in the days in, in the Forex world. He was trading uh, FX where you had 100 to 1, 400 to 1 leverage, right? The leverage was huge. Even at 50 to 1 now, which is standard, that's still a lot of leverage. So he opens his account. He puts in $5,000 on a Wednesday. We talk, get them all set up on the platform. We talk about it. I'm like, you know, the most you want to trade in these pairs is five mini contracts, um, you know, that for, for the risk tolerance you're looking at. And so he's like, okay. And he's all good. And he's got it. And, you know, the next day I walk in, he's got like 18, 20,000 in his account and he's been trading and he's kind of scaled up a little bit on the contract size. Walk in on, so that's on Thursday. On Friday, I walk in and he's got like 60 or 70,000 in his account. Walk in on Monday, he's at like 120,000. Walk in on Tuesday and he's at like 180, he's at $185,000 in his account. 5,000 to 185,000 in one week, not even quite a week. It was only Tuesday and he opened on Wednesday. He calls me up. Oh, by the way, in that time, he went from trading five mini contracts in the currency market to over a hundred standards. Sometimes he'd have position sizes of 250 standard contracts, which is huge. So he calls me up and he's like, Dan, I want to take some money out of my account. Like, great. You, um, and uh, hold on one second. looks like I might've had a network connection. Hopefully we're all good. You're so, still there, Dan. All good. No worries. Okay. Okay. Good. Good. I just saw a pop up on my screen. So, uh, so he calls me up and he's like, I want to take out $50,000 for my account. I was like, that's great. I was like, take out 150,000. Look what you did with five, you know? And, and, and I also, I mean, not to this extent, but I've seen similar runs before. And that's why they are is their runs because I could look at his pattern and, and knew that it, the way he was trading could not last forever. And when it was going to be a, a hurt, it was going to be a hurt. And I wanted to see him take some money out. So I, you know, so he's like, what do I do to take money out? And I was like, just shoot me an email, whatever amount, shoot me an email. I'll send a wire to you today, cover the wire fee. And uh, he's like, okay, I just got a couple of questions. And I was like, no, send me the email right now while we're talking. I'm on a recorded line. I can confirm that I received that and that it's being processed and it's going to be pulled out of your account immediately. He's like, oh, just a couple of questions. So I was like, okay, okay. So I answer his questions. And I'm like, okay, send me that email. I know you're in front of your computer because I just saw you place a trade. And uh, which was crazy because I was thinking, what's, what's he trading while we're talking? Like, you can't be focused on two things at once. Anyway, um, so he's like, oh, hold on. My, my brother's at the door. And, and I was like, okay, hold on a second here. Before you go get the door, this is important. It's 2008. Fed decisions were a pretty big deal. Not that they're not now, but for a while, they obviously uh, weren't as volatile. 2008, they were pretty volatile. The next day was a Fed decision. I said, okay, tomorrow at 1.15 p.m. Central, there's a Fed decision. I can't tell you not to trade, but it's going to be very volatile. And if you're trading in this position size, you can suffer some big losses really quick, even more than what you have in your account. And so I was like, now send me that email. And he's like, oh, I'll send it to you. I'll send it to you. And I was like, he hung up and I just had the sinking feeling he wasn't going to send it to me. And he didn't. I even sent him an email about 10 o'clock that night saying, hey, I didn't receive an email. Um, you know, let me know. So anyway, come in the next day and his $185,000 account is down to $18,500, right? Taking a huge loss overnight. Now, if you think about it, in one week, he went from 5,000 to 18,500, but you can guess his mindset at this point, right? Again, goes back to if you lost over 50%, and it wasn't 50% of what he initially put in, he was down so much more than 50% from, from the high of his account. Never took the money out. At that point, he should have just walked away, right? Just walk away. So anyway, I'm, I'm sitting there and I don't see him trading all morning. So I'm thinking that's a great sign. He didn't pick up his phone. I'm just going to call and talk to him. At 1.14 and 58 seconds, I look at my order monitor and his account just starts lighting up the screen. Bing, 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 bing. And in about a minute and a half, his 18500 is now only $400. So I'm thinking, okay, I got to give this guy a call. Um, I'll let him take his fist out of the wall first, see how he's doing. As I'm picking up the phone, uh, an email pops up from him, and, and legitimately, I still have the email. Hey, Dan, don't know if you saw my account last night, but the Aussie dollar really kicked my butt. Um, oh, well, easy come, easy go. How do I put more money into my account? And so I'm thinking, okay, this guy is either certifiable, should be in a padded room, 
or he's got more money than he knows what to do with this and he just wants a roller coaster ride. Well, so shoot him the, the instructions, put more money in his account. He sends in what's called an e-check for $1,000 and it bounces. Um, talk about devastating. From one day, having what would have been, you know, a great income for anybody, I would presume for 12 months, he did in a week, but never took any of it. Can't stress this enough. I have seen so many people that do really well. And uh, and the individuals I've seen crash, it's usually not, we've heard the term in the markets, escalator up, elevator down, right? The down ride goes a lot quicker. Um, a lot of that is, is uh, as I've seen the psychology of it, right? Start taking on more risk because you're losing, but you think the market's gonna change. It, it, it doesn't. Um, always have a sensible plan. So with that, we're going to talk um, a little bit because while a lot of this I can't help anybody with, one of my goals at, at Nadex as the exchange, um, I wanted contracts where people could access the markets, but they could actually define their risk and could provide natural profit targets, basically a floor and a ceiling. And so I'm going to talk a little bit, give you an example of a, of a contract that we have here. This is going to be a high level overview. Um, on the, on the contract. You're not going to be an expert on it. I'm going to show you some additional resources at the end, uh, including a free lifetime demo for those interested. But uh, first, let's just talk about this. This is a this is a spot trade, Euro USD. If you're trading futures, if you're trading other things, pretend this is your market, right? I'm going to use the numbers from the spot market, but pretend this is your market because in my mind, a chart is a chart is a chart, right? You need to understand your market. No, apologies, my slideshow is a little bit off, so some of the circles will be misplaced. I'll walk you through them. So this is a spot trade, right? This was the Euro USD. That green line and circle represent getting long at 108.40, right? We can place this trade, and then we look for a place to to set a stop. It's just an example, but I'm going to set it below that uh, where where we saw the lows previously. Probably give it a little bit of space. In this case, 45 pips, right? So you know we can have this scenario. And let's say the market goes up to 109, uh, 109.20, uh, started to drop back, we got out, all right? Not bad trade, 80 pips. Or this can happen, right? By the way, if you couldn't tell already, these charts are doctored. The market doesn't actually do two separate things um, on the same market at the same time, all right? So in this case, we got stopped out, 45 pips. I don't know if this ever happens to anybody, right? You get stopped out and then boom, that happens. Yeah, it happens all the time. It's part of trading, right? It's like the market has eyes. You get you get dinged by a, by a tick or two, you're out of the trade, and all of a sudden the market just goes in what would have been your favor, right? By the way, um, real quick, I'm going to walk through this example real quick, right? So we've got a stop of 45 pips. The Euro USD on a standard contract is $10 per pip. Um, unfortunately, I can't see the questions, but a lot of people would assume their risk on this trade. 45 times 10 is $450. And in most scenarios, it will be. However, if you're around for a long time and you're trading on leverage, there will be events that can be absolutely crushing. The actual risk on this trade, if you want to be technical, a standard contract is 100,000 euros. The value of this contract at this time is $108,400. That's actually our maximum risk. Now, you may say that's far-fetched. That can never happen. Anybody that remembers uh, just a couple of years ago, about two and a half years ago, when the Swiss National Bank pulled the peg from the euro and the euro-Swiss pair moved about 40 percent, I think it was 30, 32% roughly in there. Don't quote me on those numbers. Somewhere in that range. And people that thought they had $300 worth of risk on lost over 15000 Right? This is, the, this is the reality of it. When you're trading a leveraged contract, the losses can come quick. In August of 2013, or excuse me, 2013, longer ago than that, August of 2007, the first time I'd ever heard of the impending credit crisis, there was this thing called the carry trade, which was really big. Um, yen had low interest rates, so people were buying pound, dollar, euro against the yen. Um, and hey, it was going up, right? There was a lot of flow um, going into those. So they thought they were collecting interest. Well, I walked in one morning and overnight, there had been an intervention from the um, from the central banks, four major central banks. So you had the Fed, the ECB, and the Bank of England, who all put $100 billion into their markets, put a lot of liquidity in. At the time, that sounded like a lot of money. Uh, since we've seen a lot bigger numbers, obviously. So they all put $100 billion in. At the same time, the Bank of Japan pulled out several trillion yen, right? So supply and demand, right? Provide liquidity, it lowers the value. 
pull liquidity, it increases the value of the instrument. And there was a major shift in about, it was in seconds. Um, that day, when I walked into the office, um, so many people were doing this. In Japan, we margined out 5,000 people. And it wasn't just, hey, we had to pull your trades. It happened so quick. It was, hey, you're closed out of your positions. You had $10,000 in your account. Now you owe us 8,000. It was something like 5,000 in Japan and 10 or 15,000 in the United States in one day. Understand that risk. Understand and decide if that, that's actually right for you. Because if you're planning on trading 5, 10, 20 years, something will happen over that time. And if you're in a trade and it goes against you, that's that's... Uh, the thing about leverage, right? We never actually know. So I'm going to run through these. So here was our outcome on these, right? Just a standard trade, net profit on the two at 50, 50, 350 bucks. Pretty decent, pretty decent trade. What I want to take a look at now, and I wish I would have had this um, when when I was trading FX a lot. And I still, I still like to trade FX. I don't do it nearly as much as I could. And by the way, as full disclosure, I'm not allowed to trade at Nadex. I work for the exchange and exchange has to remain unbiased. So when I talk about my trading experience, I'm still trading things like futures. I trade a lot of stocks, stock options, um, and ETFs are the main things that I trade, um, but I'm not allowed to trade Nadex. Uh, so a Nadex spread is a short-term contract it's all defined risk. You know 100% of your risk up front. And I'm going to walk through some examples. It also gives you natural profit targets. So for those of you that may get tempted into holding on to uh, the profitable trades too long and give it back to the market, these give you natural profit targets as well. If you trade options, it's similar to a vertical option spread. If you don't trade options, don't worry about it. We have one day and intraday contracts on this. We also have now uh, launched a Bitcoin contract. Uh, that's a spread that's structured a little bit differently. I'll just touch on those in a little bit. Um, but it's basically a floor and a ceiling, buy or sell. They're all cash settled. So even though these are things based on like currencies and futures like gold and oil, there's never deliverable. It's going to be cash settled. Also, if, if you're used to trading like stock options um, or stocks, there's no pattern day trader rules. Again, if you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. Then it probably doesn't apply to you. So, so let's take a look at how they're structured. So at the exchange, we've taken a basically a simple option strategy and made it even simpler. So we produce several ranges, what we'll call ranges each day um, on um, the instruments. So I'm gonna look at a specific range here. So it's got a floor, 108.40. That's the lowest that, that market can go as far as the value of this contract. Now, obviously the market, the EURUSD spot can go much lower than that. Let's take a look at what happens in an example though. There's also a ceiling. In this case, this is a 100 pip spread. Each spread at Nadex, barring the cryptocurrencies, is $1 per tick. The tick size is variable on the market, but it's always $1 per tick. So it's an option. So we have basically a begin time and an expiration time, right? So the total value of this contract is $100. If I wanted to do the equivalent on a per point value or per pip value to the underlying market, I would do 10 contracts. So I'm going to get long at 108.47 in this example. Now, you might say, why are you getting long at 108.47? The spot FX is at 108.40. Why are you giving up seven, seven pips of premium? The reason being, this is my absolute entire risk. It doesn't matter what happens in the world. It doesn't matter if World War III breaks out, if the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man is running through the ECB. It doesn't matter. This is my maximum risk is seven seven pips to the floor. If I do 10 contracts, again, a pip on our, our currency spreads are $1 each. So that's $7 to place this contract, no multiplier. If I do 10 contracts, that's $70 risk. Now, depending on volatility in the market, if markets are a little bit more volatile, you might pay a higher premium, just how options work. So now this is my maximum return, right? The green there is my maximum return up to 109.40. That's the most I can make on this contract. So if the market goes to 109.60, I will probably just want to close out. So we place the trade and this happens. I'm not stopped out. That's the key benefit. That's why people are willing to pay premium on options because they're buying time to be right. Remember when we talked about how quickly you can get stopped out and then the market just goes in what would have been your favor? You're not out of this trade. If the market just stays down there, you know, and it expires at that level, well, then you lost your 70 bucks that you put up. 
But if this happens, right, you still had an opportunity to make money. By the way, you can take profit anywhere in that green area. So if it goes up to 109, uh, one, uh, uh, 109, uh, 100, you can, you can take profit. You can set multiple profit targets if you like. But if it goes past the ceiling, you might as well take profit. But we'll just say we let it go and it expired at 109.20. This is how that one looked. One, we never got stopped out. And our initial risk, rather than being $450, was $70. At Nadex, whatever your risk is, that's the maximum loss. That's the collateral required to secure the trade. So in this case, 10 contracts was $70. This is why I say it's uh, it's geared for, um, we're geared for individuals that really want to manage their risk because that's really what it is. If you could take, in this case, you know, let's say you could even cut your risk per trade in half and get stopped out only half the times you now do now, would you be more profitable in trading? Uh, the answer is clearly yes. So there's another scenario too, and this is where a lot of people use them, is in combination with the underlying market. Because the spread contract, I think, is a great contract, but the downside is that your upside is limited, right? So people will use these to start out a trade if it runs in their favor. Great, they close out the spread. It's all about mitigating that upfront risk. Remember when we talked about that? You need to assume the risk at the outset of the trade, right? If it goes against you, get out. In this case, you've got some flexibility because you don't have to just get out, right? Because if it goes below the floor on a long or if you're near the ceiling on a short, once it goes past that, you don't have to worry about it. So if the market makes a whipsaw against you and then, and then comes back in your direction, you're still in the trade. Other times people will use these in combination. So we list multiple ranges. So here was our original long in the spot FX, right? We have our stop at 45 pips. Again, there's multiple ranges. So this time we're gonna look at the range from 107.40 to 108.40, right? In this case, because we're going along the underlying, we're looking at just providing insurance for that position. And that's a good way to think about this, is just insurance. So I'm long the underlying, I go to my native account, and because I'm long, I want to sell. So in this case, I'm gonna sell at 108.33. We're giving up again the same seven pips. That's our risk on this trade. And then we've got that much protection. So what I see people do now in the underlying market is instead of having a 45 pip stop, and this is popular around uh, news announcements, right? If, if they have a bias on which way it's gonna go uh, because they wanna give the market some room to breathe. Now the stop is put at the floor of the contract in the underlying market for 100 pips protection, actually 93 because we're giving up seven pips. So now if something like this happens, we have a choice. We can close out the spread and close out the underlying, but instead of losing $450, again, we just lost that $70. That was our risk, right? Because that was the part we put up. Everything else was made up by the, by the width of the spread. Now, if it drops, and that's why you want to still keep a stop in there at the floor. If it drops to 10700, right? You want to be out of that trade because once it goes through the floor of that contract, then then your underlying will start losing money because you've achieved the maximum value of the spread. If something like this happens, well, you got a good run and you know the market went in your favor and you only gave up 7 pips of that move, right? So again, it's insurance. You're trying to insure a, a good size position for a little bit of money. So if we look at the outcome of this one, and I'll just set all these side by side. This this was doing 50-50, by the way. One one made money, one lost money, and, and how the um, um, things worked out. So if we're just doing the spot, it costs us about $2,168 in margin versus the spread of, I had, a, I had a collateral of $70. And the reason is it's an option, so you're just paying premium. Right? And you may say when you look at this and you look particularly the, the return on margin collateral that the spread only is the best way to go. Yes and no. I kind of think in, in a lot of cases because the combination trade, um, the profit was only slightly less. We had to put up more collateral. But now if the spot runs in our favor or if, let's say it's like a future like the ES, if that runs in our favor, it can run forever. Now we can manage the trade. So in this case, I mean, up to you, you have to have your trading plan. Remember that, know what your risk is. So here's how they're structured. So we have daily spreads, which are the wide one there in the yellow. Within those, we have multiple ranges and we have multiple ranges depending on the market of the daily as well. This is just to give you an example. 
right? We want to keep it close to a floor or ceiling. So every eight hours, we'll launch a new set of overlapping spreads. And then on the right, you see in the gray, we have three other sets of what we call two-hour spreads. So this is the market at 8 a.m. In order to keep trading opportunities, let's say the market moves up at 9 a.m. I'm going to do that again real quick because it might be a little bit slow. Do you see how the spreads, focus on the spreads on the right. As we launch the new sets an hour later, we're going to base them middle of the market to continue to give opportunities to trade. So I promised some resources here. So this is uh, Nadex homepage. Um, right from the homepage, if you want to open a demo account, this is a lifetime demo account. Um, whether you ever open a real account or not, what I want people to come in, I think these are great contracts, but they have some nuances. Spend some time in the demo account. It doesn't cost you anything. It takes about 30 seconds. I'll show you that screen. Um, you'll have it for a lifetime. And in, in full disclosure, I call it a lifetime account. Technically, um, if you, I think if you register today for your demo, um, it'll expire in the year 2055. So um, if you're still around and needing an extension at that time, contact somebody who's at the exchange and I'm sure they'll be able to help you out. We want it to go on forever because you know what? I'd much rather have people be able to practice and a demo account will never teach you how to trade. I don't care what market it is. You always have to have real money at risk before you can actually learn those lessons, but you should be doing it sensibly. Um, obviously, if you want to open an account, you can do so right online. You're actually opening an account directly with the exchange. So there's no brokers or broker commissions that go along with this. We get a small exchange fee. Um, so this is all that's required to open up uh, a demo account. And by the way, we don't have brokers here. We're an exchange. We're not allowed to solicit or sell you anything. Um, you may get a courtesy call from somebody asking if you have questions about the platform or how things work, and we're here to help you out. But you're never going to get badgered into doing anything as far as a real account. One, that would be a huge violation on our part, and two, it's just tacky. So uh, we don't endorse that here, but literally takes about uh, 30 seconds um, and you'll have the demo for life. If you're on your computer, I'd encourage you just to go do it now um, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and check it out. I'd love to hear your thoughts and feedback. And so with that, um, I'll touch on Bitcoin spreads real quick and then uh, I'll give you my email address because it looks like we're coming up on our time. And if there's any questions, I want to make sure I have some time to answer those. Uh, we do have Bitcoin spreads. These are also all cash settled. So you can buy or sell with the same ease. You don't have to worry about having a, a, a Bitcoin wallet or you know, a clean computer that's off the internet. Um, you, can do it, you can do it from your phone. You can do it from uh, your computer. Um, the width, basically it's, uh, it's a range. And what we want to do is create a, a, um, an, a, an exchange traded contract um, that's on a regulated exchange that was basically the hassle-free way to trade Bitcoin. Um, so we have two contracts. There's a weekly, which is one tenth the value of one Bitcoin. So if Bitcoin moves one dollar, our contract moves ten cents. You can of course put in more. I see actually some people, and I've talked to some that are using this to hedge off uh, some of their actual Bitcoin risk if they're actually holding Bitcoin. They also use it to speculate. The monthly has a point value of one one hundredth of Bitcoin. This is a smaller size contract, um, but again, you can trade multiple contracts. And with that. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Um, you can find us at www.nadex.com. My email is dan.cook at nadex.com. And um, with that, I'm happy to turn it back over to Jason to see if there's any uh, any any questions for me. That was fantastic, Dan. Uh, that was great. Uh, so one of the questions that came through, just are there any training or video resources that explain or could walk through the step-by-step -step, uh, approach to the hedging or spreads that you shared earlier, uh, the option strategies that you shared earlier. Is that something that you could point us to? Absolutely. Let me see if I can um, bring it up on the screen here. It might be easier. Give me one moment and I think I can bring my live one. So that should be, whoops. That's yeah, it's there. there. Okay. Um, so on, on, the, uh, on the platform, so obviously you can go here and open a demo account. Um, there's some stuff here on spreads and an overview and as well as our binary options. But if you go to Learning Center, and I'll just click on a couple of these, educational courses to find out, um, these are all PDFs on spreads. You can learn about the underlying markets, how to trade volatility, um, which is kind of more like a butterfly strategy. Um, we also have, we do about four webinars a week. Uh, so actually one coming up um, tomorrow is uh, understand the risk and reward with Nadex spreads. 
We also have on demand. So on the left hand side, hopefully you're following my cursor. Um, we have several different um, uh, presenters. So um, understanding their construct, and sorry, this is on my laptop, so um, you can't see the full screen. Um, uh, strategies for crude oil and natural gas, um, S&P 500, in the money theta, these all have different, you can choose by uh, various levels. Um, binary strangles and butterflies, and the one I'm looking for, because I think it was specific to, um, one second. Oh, you know why? Give me one second. That's cool. I, um, it's but yeah. it's in this section, right? It is in this section. Um, there's one that actually says uh, it's called the ultimate hedge strategy and talks about hedging with those. Um, the videos section. I'm just gonna I'm gonna show it real quick. Um, this I'm in the process of redoing. Um, the how-to is very good if you're trying to learn the platform. Um, you've got a platform tour in there, how to open charts, place trades, things like that. Spreads has some basic, these are all like, um, excuse me, two to two to five minute video tops. Um, by the way, these are a little bit old. We're kind of redoing everything here. Um, uh, trade examples and eBooks. Um, so, you know, you can download these eBooks. Um, so all underneath educational resources. Um, and then that's something I'm really working actually on, on building out and making even better because I think it's very, very important. That was a great question. Very cool. Okay, so another question that you mentioned that uh, Rowan's going to be counted for a uh, broker relationship, but are there brokers that you can refer or partner brokers with Nadex that someone can go and check out? Uh, there there are not uh, currently partner brokers um, uh, with, with Nadex. So the account would be open directly with the exchange. Um, uh, all funds held in segregated accounts. So we do look like a broker actually, because we're one of the few, uh, and it's kind of unique about us, we're one of the few, first of all, exchanges designed for individual traders rather than institutions, as well as a place where people can come and trade directly on exchange uh, rather than going through a broker. Although that may change one day, I'll keep everybody updated if that does happen. Okay, okay. Uh, those of you that are asking about recordings of this event, or of course, uh, post the recording, you expect that up in the next 24 hours. And then if you had to duck out early, I saw a couple of folks that asked about it because they had to go grab a sandwich or something. We will go ahead and send a link to the recording as well as any links uh, to the resources here that Dan is mentioned. So Dan, I think that brings us on the home stretch. Um, you know, we've been looking forward to this for quite some time, and uh, it was great. Thank you very much. So we look forward to doing this again. I absolutely look forward to it, and, uh, and and thanks for having me on, and I appreciate everybody's questions and participation. It's always a lot of fun, and it's something near and dear to my heart. Absolutely. Absolutely. Hey, Dan, one more question before we let you go. Yep. Is the account money insured? This is uh, Barbara. I saw that come through just a second ago. Uh, no. Unlike... Um, uh, no, no futures accounts or forex accounts are insured. Um, the only time you get like a SIPC is is if you're trading things like equities. And the reason being, when you're trading things based on futures or futures derivatives or currencies, um, you're actually not owning that. Um, you're you're owning um, uh, you're just taking a position. Um, whereas in in the equities market, you have like SIPC protection because you you're actually owning part of a company. Um, so there's a, there's a bit of a difference there. Uh, they are held in top tier. Um, I will say they are held in top tier uh, uh, U.S. banks uh, in in a segregated account that actually has one level more of of protection because it's considered a swap account. So it is held in your name, cannot be commingled with anybody else's funds uh, or company funds. Perfect. Perfect. I think we'll go ahead and leave it at that. Uh, Dan, thanks again, everyone. Thank you for joining. We look forward to having you back on our next events. And uh, Dan, have a great 4th of July if we don't talk sooner, okay? Thank, thanks you as well. I appreciate it, Jason. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye.